And now please welcome Matt Herbrock. Thank you, Haley. And uh, thank you everyone uh, for coming to my presentation, virtually coming to my presentation. I appreciate that and I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to see such a high level of interest in uh, regenerative and no-till farming. Um, uh, I, I think I'll start by just uh, a brief introduction and the introduction actually has a point to it too, which I'll try to make. Uh, but this is this is who I am. I'm Matt Herbrook. I own a farm called Birdsong Farm LLC. It's in Garrettsville, Ohio, which is in the northeast part of the state. And there's some contact information for me right there. Um, emailing me is great. I'll, I answer questions by, via email. You can also follow me on Instagram. Um, my website is moderately functional. I, so that's uh, sort of a last resort, but um, happy to answer questions at any time uh, about this topic that we are about to dive into, um, transitioning my farm from uh, a traditional tillage-based uh, approach to producing food, uh, vegetables, herbs, flowers, to a no-till regenerative uh, approach. Um, by way of further introduction and, and so that you understand where I'm coming from, and also the point of this is to see if maybe, uh, this is for you to see how relevant some of the things I'm talking about are to you and your farms. It's my hope that you will be able to place yourself in my shoes, so to speak. Um, and maybe some of the things I talk about in this presentation are uh, things that you've experienced on your own farm, uh, in your own soils, maybe in your own marketplaces, um, maybe even in your own heads. And I, I hope to be able to match up with you on that. So I thought it'd be helpful to let you know some of my experience and you know the size of my farm and things like that. Um, and you can place yourself along with, uh, you know, see if you can place yourself in my shoes and see if some of these things would be relevant to you. And I hope they are. I have been farming for 25 years or more. I think this is my 26th season coming up. And uh, I've been doing it in two states. I started in the state of Maine. And I've been in Ohio since 2009. So the piece of property I'm currently farming that I have transitioned to no-till, I started tilling essentially in 2009. Um, I currently have one full-time and a couple of part-time employees. Um, and that's relevant because pre-2017 when I was uh, tilling and, and doing a more traditional tillage-based approach, we had uh, five or six employees at any given time. Um, I own 25 acres, as you can see, uh, about 10, maybe 11 or 12 of them are tillable. Pre-regenerative no-till agriculture, I farmed all of those. Those were all planted. I currently grow on only about five acres. So that's relevant because um, I think you'll see in the course of my presentation, switching to a no-till type of operation has allowed me to streamline things to the point where I grow the same, if not more, essentially, things on about half as much land. I also have, as you can see, far fewer employees, which is it's actually pretty good for the bottom line. It's not great for employment, I guess, employment numbers, but um, it's way easier to manage. Um, the reason I put my gross sales figure up there is simply, that's a very round number. That goes up or down 10 to 20%, depending on a lot of different factors. But I wanted to throw that out there because uh, the point I wanted to make about A, just to let you know the relative size of what I'm doing, and B, because that number has stayed about the same from pre-switch to no-till to post. In other words, in the tillage-based arena, I was doing about that with five or six employees, and now I'm doing about that on half the land with far fewer employees. So, uh, oh, this is, a, this is not a great picture, uh, but it does remind me that I wanted to also say to you that my marketing is primarily at farmer's markets. So I do uh, four farmer's markets per week, sometimes three, and um, I have a CSA. I have about, it's not very big, it's about 40 to 45 members of a CSA, and that is 98% of my marketing is direct marketing to the public that way. Um, tiny, tiny, tiny bit of restaurant business, but really not worth mentioning. So hopefully some of you can see yourselves in, in that and that uh, you can sort of maybe 
take from my experience as something that would relate to your farm. Um, and as I move forward through this program, I, I do want to real quick housekeeping. Haley talked about questions. I think the most effective thing is going to be to type your questions into the chat. And um, Haley is going to be collating those. Um, and I am going to stop every, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes and we'll kind of take questions to keep them fresh so that we're not trying to do questions about something I talked about 50 minutes ago at the end. But at the end, we're going to, you know, hey, have a larger question session, at which point we may be able to unmute people and do something a little more personal. But as far as I can tell, there's a lot of people in this thing. And so it could get crazy if we, uh, we all start trying to unmute. So let's, uh, let's try to go with that. Um, and I'll just move right into it. I, I wanted to kind of do a quick uh, I don't know, definition uh, where I'm going to tell you that what I'm doing as far as no-till, not tilling the soil being an important component of what is referred to as regenerative agriculture. I'm sure everybody here is pretty familiar with that. Um, that's describing a practice that rebuilds soil organic matter um, and restores degraded soils and degraded soils biodiversity. And this can result in significant carbon drawdown, which is one thing I'm very interested in and great improvements in nutrient cycling capacity, which is another thing I'm, as a production level farmer for my living, for all my life, that's, uh, you know, I'm very interested in uh, the highest nutrient cycling capacity that I can get. I've also had kind of a personal thing. This is a weird picture of a compost pile steaming. But in there is a story about what really was the catalyst for me to switch from tillage-based agriculture that I've been doing for close to 20 years to a no-till system. And that was a cataclysmic weather event. Um, I don't know how many of you remember in 2016, there was a really, really bad drought in this area and, and a lot of areas, I think, in the center part of the country and center part of North America. Um, and after, so that was 2016, I'd been basically tilling and plowing my fields, my vegetable fields for since 2009. And uh, when the drought came, the effects of the reduced organic matter from all that tillage really, really came to the front, really, really became uh, very obvious and crystal clear to me as I write. Um, the lack of water holding capacity and just the soil structure itself, uh, the carbon materials haven't been degraded to the point where I was left with uh, dust in a lot of places. You can really see a microcosm of what happened uh, in the Dust Bowl. <laughs> so the stress of these conditions on my farm led me to really do a lot of soil searching. And I had to try and make uh, changes to my farm and to my farming approach or else I was probably going to have to quit because I was going insane. <laughs> so um, about that time, luckily, no-till vegetable production on a small scale started to become a thing a lot of people were talking about. And... Um, and I started reading about it. So, um, trying to advance this slide here. So Haley, my slide's not advancing. Are you working in PowerPoint? Yeah. Do you wanna just um, press the escape button? And uh, just go to the next slide manually and, and start the slideshow there. Okay. I don't know what the problem would be. Oh. <laughs> so I did a, I'm getting a... Um... Yeah, why don't we um, reload that page that you were on? So push, push escape. And um, reload the page up at the top by the um, URL reload the page yeah you can just click in the the url box and push enter do, do, do. thanks for your patience guys <laughs> yeah thank you for your patience yeah and then go down to my slide yep that helps Yeah, that's the slide I wanted to get to. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so I thought it'd be uh, helpful to start with uh, pre-switching to the regenerative uh, no-till approach. 
and talk briefly about what we were doing before that time on the farm um, and the tillage approach. On the left, there's a picture of what many of you, many of you have seen in some of, some of your fields. That's me getting ready to uh, till that. I have a six foot rototiller that goes on the back of a big tractor. And we would, uh, that picture actually looks like I chisel plowed that at first to break up some of the plow pan that gets created after too much tillage and plowing. Um, so it looks like I chisel plowed that to break up the compaction. And then of course I would, on the right, come in with my giant rototiller and uh, rototill it to create a stale seed bed. And then we would uh, typically on my farm lay either single use uh, one mil plastic on the left at a mulch layer that did that. Um, I happily uh, have sold that. I no longer need that. I Using that much plastic mulch for those five or six or seven years was killing me. That was a hugely wasteful process, I thought. Um, so, but we did do that or we would, on the right, we have, a, I have a, what's essentially a potato planter that I pulled behind a tractor to make those rows. I know it's a little hard to see, but those are essentially very small beds. Um, and the potato planter in the hopper, you can put in whatever amendments you want. So we would, uh, you know, plow, rototill, put down mulch, make rows, um, and then plant into it, uh, either transplant or with a jank seeder. But the problems with that, of course, and this is sort of something that we, I had to get my mind around, was the rapid breakdown of the organic matter. Um, the organic matter, I don't want to get, this is not a soil science presentation, but organic matter, of course, is the essential building block of your soils. Um, you need a high level of organic matter for a number of things in terms of water holding capacity and nutrient exchange capabilities. The higher your organic matter, the higher your cation exchange capacity is, which is a measurement of the availability of the nutrients to the plants. So you want a high level of organic matter. Well, plowing or rototilling, particularly rototilling and rotovating, you're introducing oxygen at a rapid rate to the C, the carbon, the organic matter in your soil, and you're breaking down that carbon, that C, rather quickly. And unfortunately, you're also off-gassing a, a product when you combine C and O2, CO2, which is a greenhouse gas. And I don't think any of us really want to do that. That's a big, that was a big thing for me. So the rapid breakdown of the organic matter, which was evident to me when we had a really bad drought and a lot of times, um, the, the off-gassing of the CO2, the destruction of what I call the microbiome, you know, the microorganisms, microbes, nematodes, fungus, those kinds of things. I was also noticing some other things, problems with tillage, the inefficient planting patterns that would come from uh, fertility varying down the row or within the bed. Um, I noticed weed prevalence actually is increasing over time. Um, and that's particularly in the sense of, or as it pertains to perennial grasses. Um, perennial grasses, of course, grow from rhizomes. All you're really doing with row tiller is chopping those up. And, um, moving them around. <laughs> so uh, perennial grasses were a huge issue for us. We grow a lot of salad mix and things like that, and we were getting grass on our salad mix. Uh, and that really just seemed unsustainable. Insects, pests, diseases, they really weren't abating all that much. In fact, some of them would get worse, flea beetles in particular. And of course, decreases in fertility in general and inefficient harvests, which of course come from inefficient planting patterns. So those are some of the issues I ran into. There's other things too. Erosion will be a problem when you don't have a lot of organic matter and water holding capacity in your soils. So what was I going to do? I, I, this was the point at which I had to make a decision about how to switch to a regenerative uh, approach. Um, perhaps this is a time to check and see if there's any questions. Haley, has anybody typed any questions at all? Before I jump into what we began to do switching wise. If anybody does have any questions about the intro part. The only question I saw was one um, wanting to know what farmer's markets you're at. Oh, I do uh, Kent, Ohio, um, Haymaker Farmer's Market. I do Chagrin Falls Farmer's Market in Chagrin Falls. <laughs> uh, I do Garrettsville, my hometown has a farmer's market and it's actually really very good on Thursday evenings, Garrettsville. And I do Geographresh Farmer's Market, which is in South Russell, I believe, 
municipality. So two of them are on Saturday, one's on Sunday, and one's on Thursday night. And one of them can't go year round. Actually, South Russell goes year round too, but it's like every other week. So good question. And I think now I go ahead and, and jump into what we've been doing on our farm in the last few years to switch some of that tillage, those that tillage-based approach to a no-till approach and alleviate some of those problems that we were talking about. So I'll just start talking about how we set up our no-till beds initially from the get-go. Um, this is an actual picture of us doing that. This is the first beds we were setting up. Um, I had that picture saved. And um, I guess I wanna start off by saying, before I get too deep into this, that uh, I get asked a lot about how long it took to switch to no-till or to, I don't know, maybe complete the switch. I'm not sure there's a completion, but I want to say that um, it's a lot of change is hard. I know that, and, and you might think it might take years to see results, but I want to just say quickly that we saw results from our no-till switch within the first season we did it. And these are the first beds we made. And this was about, this, I think this was about June, and we were seeing positive results in these beds within a few months. So don't think that it's going to, you know, you'll see some time frames I put up here. Don't think it's going to take years to see positive results. It's amazing, actually, the regenerative capability of your soils. So for starters, we uh, tarped, so we occultate, we use black silage tarps, and you're going to hear me talk about that a lot. Uh, that's a key thing to us. Um, this was a field that we had grown crops in before. This was not a, a, a hay field by any stretch. We occultated it for, in this case, we occultated it for, I'm going to say, about four months. You may want to drag its tarp, and I will talk more about that um, in a bit, but we, you may want to put a tarp over an area that you want to create beds in for anywhere from two to 12 months, depending on what type of weeds and weed pressure you're trying to kill out. Um, we did this one for, this was already a plowed area. So this, I think it took it three or four months to kind of get it to where we wanted it. We broad fork the beds. Um, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with broad forks. Uh, we have some really rugged ones there. And uh, so we broad fork those to aerate them and loosen up the soils. At which point we added any mineral amendments we wanted um, based on a soils test. And then we dragged the tarp back over it briefly again and that was primarily to kill that next little flush of weeds that we would get after we brought those weed seeds to the surface by by broad fork um, and then we add compost and i write here usually only after occultation just before we plant in other words we plant right into compost um, that that is there's a catch 22 to that so when you're adding compost we use a ton of compost and when you're adding compost to beds there is a danger that if you drag a black tarp over the top of this living soil in the middle of the summer, that you're going to damage the microbiology in that compost. Um, so if it's hot and real sunny, we don't do that. Um, but then on the other side of that coin is there is an advantage in the shoulder seasons to actually compost right on top of weed residues or crop residues and then drag that tarp over the compost that heat activates the microbiology in the, in the compost and helps break down those uh, resi residues, your crop residues or your, or your weed residues. So you kind of have to go by the, the, the brightness of the sun and the, the, what time of year it is. The last thing you want to do is damage the microbiology of your compost. Um, so you have to weigh those things. But the biggest point that I'm trying to make is we uh, want to build organic matter. Um, the whole focus of the regenerative system is to build the organic matter in the soils. Um, in this picture, you can see we've, we have pretty heavy compost on these beds. And then Jason is coming through and, and putting straw on top of them. I'm guessing this is garlic. It looks like there's snow in the upper left corner there. So um, we're mulching the garlic with straw. But all of this is adding carbon to our soils, we are trying to uh, jack that carbon up and get those microbes to be chewing it up and making the nutrients more available to our plants. So anything we can do to add carbonaceous material to the soils we do. You're seeing here compost, you're seeing here straw. Another approach is to grow a cover crop in place on the beds and then crimp it 
and then pull your tarp over it. In the upper right corner of this picture, you can see that's a, the underside of our tarps. We use five or six mil silage tarps, black on one side, white on the other. They are 40 feet or 50 feet wide and 100 feet long. And the black side up is what you're gonna to wanna to do. Um, the white side up is for a few other things that don't even really pertain to this, this talk, but um, it can be useful, but black and white is nice. Um, when you grow a cover crop in place, this happens to be, looks like sorghum and probably some sun hemp in there on those beds. Grow that in place. Our crimper is really fancy. It's a pallet that we tie a rope to. <laughs> we drag the pallet over the, over the, the cover crop growing place and it crimps it. I don't have a fancy roller crimper. Crimps it enough that you can drag a tarp over it and one to two months later, you have a really nicely broken down cover crop right on top of your beds. The worst that you may have to do is rake that off just a little bit if you're gonna direct seed a fine seed. I wanna make another point here too. Um, a, a beauty of this is, one of the beauties of this is not only the carbon you're adding, but the root structures of the cover crop we leave in place. In fact, we leave root balls in place all the time uh, of everything. Um, root zones are fantastic while the plant is alive. The root exudates are feeding the microbiology in your soil. And when the plant is dead or terminated, the root balls become a lovely place for fungus and fungal growth, uh, fungal hyphae to grow. So to me, roots, root zones and root balls are just more carbon, just more uh, area for my microbes and things like that to grow that are benefiting your soil. We leave root balls in place. That's we very rarely, almost never, do we pull a large plant out by the root ball and throw it out. Uh, other sources of carbon, of course, we make good use of municipal leaves. We get uh, there on the left, you can see. Uh, we spread them on some beds. That picture on the right is what I call my curvy beds. Uh, you can't really tell, but that really is a pretty serious slope there. And we've built these beds into the side of the hill. So we've, we've used uh, leaf, leaves for that. We get wood chips. You can ask any tree guy. Mostly they're trying to get rid of wood chips. So you can try to get some wood chips. We do use some level of manure, but I am somewhat leery of manures for a couple of reasons. And one of them is uh, residual herbicides. Um, there's an issue with residual herbicides in compost and also in manures if uh, the hay and straw that the animals are eating moves through their system and um, the residual herbicides on those hays and straws don't go away. And then if you add that to your soils, it could be an issue. I haven't had that issue myself, but I'm worried about it. So manures, I'm a little cautious of, unless I really know where they come from. But increasing and preserving organic matter is, esen is essential to the no-till approach. Increases the water holding capacity, improves aeration, increases available nutrients, and it builds the healthy microbiome, which is what we want. Um, diversity of microbes in the soil equals fewer pests and disease issues, a fact that I'll talk about further when we talk about pests and disease. And of course, that equals healthier crops and increased, increased efficiencies, which we're all looking for. Um, I think perhaps maybe this is another place we might want to take a few questions. I'm about 23 minutes in here. Haley? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a lot of questions regarding tarping. Oh, um, good. I'll start at the top. Well, I had a quick one. Is there a reason that you crimp as opposed to mow? Like, is there a difference? And, um, and when, you, when you mow, you're going to be probably driving something over the soil over your beds. So, I mean, if you did it with a weed whacker, you'd be okay, but yeah. we don't drive any equipment in our fields. Love it. Compaction. No tractors, nothing like that. Great. Silage tarp, methods for laying relatively easily on the field? Uh, meaning that they are hard to drag around because they're heavy? Yeah, that's the difficult thing. <laughs> we, use, we use sandbags to, to weigh them down. You're going to have to invest in a bunch of sandbags um, <laughs> to hold them down. And uh, lacking that, you can use logs and things like that. We, we usually need a couple of people to drag one around. And I have taken to balling it up and 
wrapping a chain around it and hooking onto a bucket of the tractor and backing up, making care of being sure not to drive onto the field, but driving down the road with it, getting yeah. it close to where I need it, and then dragging it out. Um, after a rain, you know, you're in trouble because there's a lot of water on that tarp. Moving tarps can be a drag. Um, you will get better at folding them like an accordion and then moving them folded up and then unfolding them as you go. But that's, that's a hard thing. You can get smaller tarps. I'm just, I got big tarps. Uh, you can get 20 footers, things like that, if you have a smaller area. Great. Did you shape a raised bed prior to doing the initial no-till prep? No, no. Um, we, most of these fields, oh, and a point I was, that reminds me of a point I was gonna make, but most of these fields had already been in production. So, um, some of them had sort of natural rows from the previous tillage production, uh, but no, not really. Uh, the, the act of broad forking does kind of shape a bed a little bit. I know a lot of people will go ahead and they use like a BCS to build a bed and then build on top of that. We're just building beds from like sea level, if you will, you know, and building up with um, compost and leaves and things like that. So um, the another point I was gonna make that also that remind me of is, uh, what was it? Oh, that, that, that area that you saw, that was just, the, the first year I went into this, that area is about a half an acre. So we worked with a half an acre in year one and saw such positive results that the very next year, I put all my acreage in no-till. Okay, we're getting a lot of questions here. Um, one that I found interesting was, if you tarp everything, are you not worried about anaerobic bacteria or is everything not covered long enough for it to matter? Yeah, I mean, that's what I was kind of talking about with the, the microbiology being hurt. Um, you can see some negative effects with anaerobic bacteria too. We are not tarping, that's a good point. The slide we were looking at was initial bed setup and that's why some of those longer terms of tarping were written down there. Um, the longest time I ever tarped anything was one year. That was where I put asparagus. So I really wanted to get it killed out. Um, we typically, as you move through crop successions in beds that you have created, you will find that your tarping time is going to go way down from months to weeks. I mean, we often now, when we do a bed flip, and I have a whole section on bed flip I'm about to talk about, when we do a bed flip, we'll tarp for one to three weeks at most. Yeah. You want to do one more question or should I just keep going? Let's see. I think that question about the tomato root ball, oh. tomato roots, it would be quick. Yeah. Are you worried about spreading That's disease? Right. Um, I mean, we rotate so much that I haven't seen much of that problem. I understand what you're saying as far as disease in the field. Um, we don't grow all that many field tomatoes anymore. We do them in high tunnels. So, um, I, but that is, I would say that's a consideration. If you had a really bad disease problem, like with uh, Phytophthora or something like that, you would want to remove that. We remove the top of the plant and any spent fruit, things like that. But that's a good question. That's something to keep an eye on, I would say. Yeah. Let's move on. Okay. Hopefully this advances. Oh, yeah, weed management. I get asked about weed management a lot in, um, in farming in general and in, 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 uh, in the no-till approach. Um, so I thought I would address that in a special section. Um, it's really kind of miraculous, the whole weed management thing, no-till wise. Um, occultation, the tarping is, of course, one of the keys um, for us. And there are other approaches similar to that. You'll hear of solarization with clear plastic. Um, we've tried that with not as good of results, but we, we do occultate to kill weeds. Um, the way that works is when you're, so the black plastic tarp is gonna hold some moisture in the ground when you tarp it. And that, which is lovely when you pull it off, it's these wet beds. But what's happening is that moisture is causing the weed seeds in the top half inch or so of the soil to sprout. They sprout, but then they don't have any light, so they die. Um, you're also killing out some perennial grasses. We had really great luck with tarping uh, perennial grasses, but that's the way occultation sort of works. Um, weed sprout, no light, they die. Then you can pull the tarp off and you got these, these clean weeds, uh, clean seed bed uh, that you can plant right into. Um, 
we use flame weeding. I have a flame weeder, it's a backpack flame weeder, and we use that pretty liberally to help break down some materials. Um, flame weeding, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, it's really mostly effective on small weeds, just sprouted weeds, it's less effective on tall, big weeds. Uh, we mulch a lot. Um, we do use a lot of ground cover that we plant right through, like tomatoes, uh, peppers, eggplants, flowers. Uh, but we also use a, a lot of straw. Um, we'll use wood chips if I can make sure that they're not um, uh, walnut. And uh, we use a lot of leaves. Uh, leaves broken down are better. Uh, we do use some hand tools, of course, wire weeders and collinear hose in particular. Um, but I have to tell you that our hand weeding is a lot less than it used to be. Um, I think I have a slide that refers to this a little bit later. But uh, after, a, really even after a couple of years, but after I'm gonna say six or eight crop cycles through some beds, you are gonna see, I have seen such a significant reduction in weed pressure um, that hand weeding and wire weeding uh, or hand weeding and, or weeding with hand tools becomes much uh, less of an issue, much less of something you have to spend a lot of time on, a huge time saver. I would say that my weed pressure is reduced easily 60 to 70% and maybe more than that in a lot of beds. And hence, most of you who are production farmers know, time spent weeding is greatly reduced, freeing up time to grow more food or go fishing in the evening if you want. Um, we also use some level of heavy compost mulch. This is a little bit of a controversial topic in, in, um, in no-till. Uh, that essentially means instead of putting like one inch of compost on, putting like five inches of compost on and planting right through that. So the point I would make about that is on our initial bed setup, we do use a pretty heavy application of compost. Subsequent bed flips, we put on what I would call a maintenance level of compost. So we're really not doing that last one in that list as far as heavy compost mulch, um, but I've seen it done. You could do that using the actual compost as a mulch, squelching out those weeds and planting right through that. Some people will tell you that you can get uh, some excess nutrients doing that. Um, so weeds, continuing the discussion about weeds, I want to do a before and after, a couple before and after pictures. On the left is a picture of onions on one mil black plastic. Thank goodness I don't use that anymore. And I want you to look here in between the beds, particularly in between these two beds here. But each bed here, these onions are pretty young. They look like they've only been planted for a few weeks. And what do I have in between my beds where I drove the tractor? A lot of weeds starting in. And this is only after looks like maybe three or four weeks at the most. And that, worse than that, that's perennial grasses growing in there. So even though in my tillage-based system, where this picture is from, from who knows when, early part of the, probably like 2012 or 13, um, even though I'm using black plastic mulch, I'm still gonna have a ton of weed pressure in between the beds and even in the holes, if you look here. So on the right is a picture of spinach growing in no-till beds that are in their second year. And I just wanted to point out the lack of perennial grasses in particular in between the beds. Upper in the upper right corner, you can see a little line of weeds. That's where two tarps came together. <laughs> You're always gonna have that, that place where a little light got in and you know, so, but it, where the tarps have laid and where we have intensively managed these beds, we have much less pressure. And this is, I know these beds. This, is, this picture was taken two years at the end of the second year of no-till is what I'm trying to say, time frame wise. Uh, another before and after, carrots, a real hassle. That's what I call this slide. On the left is what my carrot beds used to look like mid-season. See that pitchfork there? There are carrots in there. I mean, you can see them right here. I'm harvesting them. But, uh, you know, the efficiency there is like zero. Uh, harvesting carrots is not efficient. Uh, in that system. On the right is a picture of uh, a three-year no-till bed with carrots growing in it, and there's nothing but carrots. So uh, to me, that is you know, worth it in itself, that I can grow carrots and make money. It's like a mirror. Uh, um, I struggled with that for most of my career. <laughs> uh, so 
Some weed related observations. Tarping is uh, more effective on perennial grasses than anything I've ever tried. We were battling perennial grasses in all our crops uh, and occultating with five or six mil silo sharps has really cleared up that issue a lot. Thistle still remains tough. Uh, certain other things with tap roots like mullen. Um, but then again, mullen's kind of cool. I don't really mind a mullen plant here and there. So you will learn to live with weeds, gain some acceptance of weeds. Many of them can be useful. Um, in fact, I am right now starting to, you know, the next phase of my no-till approach is learning how to make uh, nutrient extracts from certain weeds like mullen and nettles and things like that. Um, so I'm doing that with uh, apple cider vinegar and water and things. So you have to gain some acceptance of weeds. Some of them you're just never going to get rid of. My farm is not perfect um, and I don't expect it to be. There's beauty in some of the disarray. Um, but if you can get the weeds out of your salad mix, I definitely would recommend that. Um, you also see successions of different weeds as you move through the seed bank. So what's happening is each time you flip a bed, uh, you're going to kill a certain segment of the weed seed that's in that uh, top, say, I don't know, inch of the soil, and they'll be gone. And then a new, it's kind of interesting, a new kind of weed will come the next time. And you'll say, wow, that's I hadn't seen so much of that before. But then you can move through that type of weed onto another one. And after a few times through, you'll see less and less and less. Happily, one of the ones, the first ones to go was giant ragweed. I had a ton of giant ragweed on my farm, and it doesn't seem to stand tarping at all. So that's a good one to move through. And of course, reduced labor. Here's what I was talking about. I've reduced my weed pressure by 60 to 70%, and that's probably low. That's probably a low number. So you can imagine the labor savings on that. And I want to talk about bed flips because that's a big topic of conversation in no-till, but should we take questions? I know we're probably running. Yeah, we're doing okay. Any questions? Haley? Yeah, let me see here. Um, some of these you answered throughout your talk, so. Okay, we can revisit that at the end. Yeah, too. let's do that. Okay. All right, so. I want to run through bed flip, how we do it on our farm. Um, bed flip refers to changing uh, from a cash crop to another crop, whether it's a cash crop or a cover, or, or changing from a cover crop to basically changing crops <laughs> in a set bed. My beds, as I wanted to mention, but might not have, are all 100 feet long. Makes sense, right? The tarps are 100 feet long. So when we are done with the crop, we want to be able to efficiently switch from that crop to another crop that is doing something good for us, preferably making money or building carbon in the soil. So bed flip refers to doing that as quickly as possible. And step one on our farm for bed flip is clear the bed of the previous crop, which is easier than it sounds because um, you already have less weeds, particularly if you're several crop cycles into setting up no-till beds. And because of the efficiencies that you've built in through no-till, most of your crop was marketable. We use a Jang seeder. I didn't mention that, but the Jang is a really helpful tool. Most of you probably are familiar with those. Um, and because of the fertility that you're building up and the friability and, and the tilt of the soil being better, most of you, and if you're careful about planting and uh, spacing, most of your crop will be marketable. At least for me, in tillage-based agriculture, I would find through the length of the row, I would have some, some of the crop marketable, and then it would tail off in places, and then get better in places, and tail off in places. Sometimes they would grow at different rates. I find much less of that in the no-till approach. So clearing the bed of the previous crop, hopefully you've just harvested the previous crop and gotten rid of it. But of course, there will be some residues, um, and there's some options for clearing those residues. Uh, I kind of have this a little backwards, but I'll talk about manually. We, we will occasionally use a scuffle or a collinear hoe to scrape that up, being really careful not to damage or disturb the soil too much. Flame weeders do help if you have a fairly high level of residue. If you hit it with a flame weeder, most of you probably know how they work. They don't burn the crop or burn the, the plant. They, the heat of the flame heats up the cell structures in that plant and they kind of explode and plant just kind of withers and dies and it really breaks down much quicker. So if you hit it with a flame weeder, it helps a lot. You can do some hand stuff too, like raking. And like I mentioned, we rarely hand pull anything and we leave root balls in place. Preferable though, in the no-till system and the regenerative system is biological clearing of residues by occultating for one to three weeks, 
hitting it with the flame weeder real quick and then occultating for as little as a week. And then what I mentioned earlier about the compost and the tarping, we found this past year, we started to get better at dusting uh, a maintenance level of compost on say salad mix or arugula or really any easily compostable crop residues, pulling a, a tarp over that for a week or two. And when you, the biological activity under you know, there, which is impacted by the heat that you're creating and the moisture that you're holding in the tarp, when you pull that tarp off, it's clear. I mean, you have a few dead things, sticks laying around, but we often can just plant right through that. So that's a helpful thing. Of course, step two would be to amend after you've cleared residues. Um, and in clearing residues, that may take as little as an hour, or if you're gonna tarp, maybe you've got a week, but um, we'll add compost in step two, rock powders. Typically we're doing rock powders in the spring or the fall, not the middle of summer. Fertilizer I have listed here. Um, I wanna make a point about fertilizers. I, I have in the past used a lot of Revita Pro. I'm sure you're all familiar with Revita Pro. It's a great product. Um, I don't use hardly, I, I, I barely use any of that anymore. Um, I have gone from using a couple pallets of that a year to like one bag of it a year, just because of the nutrients and the nutrient cycling I've been able to enhance in my soils through no-till. So my fertilizer input has gone to almost zero. Now we do use a lot of compost, which some people would call fertilizer, but we don't use as much fertilizer anymore. It doesn't mean you shouldn't or can't, we just don't. These are some pictures of some beds that we have amended uh, with compost and are ready to plant again. We have three high tunnels, uh, four really, I guess. Uh, and we also, you know, we do a lot in the field. So the process is the same, tunnels or outside. And then step three, of course, is plant. We jan direct seeded stuff for the most part, or we transplant. And I have written here, this can be done within the hour. And that should probably say this should be done within the hour. You should get efficient at bed flipping. Um, now, of course, if you're going to do an occultation period in between clearing and planting, it's, you know, you've expanded that time frame. But the point is, when you pull that tarp off, you need to plant immediately. Mainly because it's, it, you don't, this, this real estate is valuable. You don't want that sitting there, not growing something that's either benefiting you, your pocketbook, or growing carbon for your soils. So bed flipping is, if you're gonna move into a regenerative system, it's, you know, we're still working on it. It's something that you really need to dial in and get good at, um, particularly if you're growing on a small footprint. And particularly about if you're doing it in high tunnels. Be diligent and quick. The composting of the crop residues is a bonus. This is carbon that you've grown, why waste it? Flaming helps with the crop residues. And something that I, a point I wanna make about the regenerative approach is focusing on smaller areas makes the whole farm more productive. In my previous farming 20 years, before I started doing no-till, I would look at an acre or two acres or five acres and think about how I could grow crops there. How am I gonna grow crops there? No-till regenerative approach has had the wonderful effect of making me focus on like, one bed or two beds or three beds. And that doesn't, that might not sound like a lot, especially to some larger farmers, but the productivity that I can coax out of one bed is immense if you pay enough attention to it. So focusing on smaller areas has really made my farm way more productive. You need to, in bed flip, get used to going from this which is an old crop of kale. Looks to me like it's probably midsummer, and this kale is on its last legs. I'll probably harvest it one more time, get rid of it. And then I'm gonna go through and cut it off at ground level, leaving the root balls in place. And then you need to go to this, which is clear beds. Uh, Jason on the right is adding some compost to some clear beds. And on the left, he's adding some compost to some, it looks like we're gonna plant peas there maybe, because I've trenched it. And then you know, the third step of course is this. So quick succession, this to this to this. On the left, you've got direct seeded carrots just coming up. In the middle, we've got looks like kohlrabi transplanted. And on the right, I've got some looks like scallions in a high tunnel. Quick successions, quick bed flips are important. Um, 
Questions? Bed flips? That was, I kind of ran through that quickly. There's probably a lot more ideas about bed flips. Ailey, do you want to do questions now or? Yeah, I have a couple that I consolidated from that I should have asked okay. in the last, last section, but um, a few people wonder where you get your compost. Do you do it yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we, the answer is yes, yes and yes. <laughs> I buy compost in. Um, when I first started doing no-till, we weren't making a lot of compost. Um, no-till has the effect also of getting you really excited about making compost. So I now have, we are ramping up our compost production. Um, I'm working with the town to take leaves as you saw a picture of. Um, I'm working with Hiram College a little bit on some food waste stuff. That's having some issues, but we, are, we do have an on-farm composting operation but it's not enough. And especially at the beginning of setting these up, I buy compost. Am I allowed to say companies' names here? Because I don't I really- so. so I use Nate Rutsky, um, Rust Belt Riders. Uh, and I also use um, uh, Harvey's and Credit Soil. Both of those are NOP approved or OMRI approved and NOP compliant. And I use both those products. Um, Nate is a, a, up at Rust Belt Riders is a, really smart soils guy, really into microbiology. His product is great. And I've had good luck with Harvey and Credit, and Harvey's and Credit Soil too. So we buy those in two. We generally use about maybe 15 to 20 yards of bought in compost, maybe 20 yards bought in, and then some that we make. Awesome. And then there was some discussion about um, the material that you use for um, oculation. Some people wondered about cardboard, uh, fabric, and then they also Perfect. wondered whether plant, you have a problem with plant materials poking holes in the plastic. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I have heard of cardboard being used very successfully. Now I am certified organic. And so I'm pretty careful about any materials I'm gonna break down into my soils. There is some school of thought that some of the glues in cardboard might not be okay. In that sense, um, outside of that, I think cardboard does work very well if you have a lot of cardboard and you're not getting certified. Um, the black tarps we use, I mean, I guess the question about poking them, yeah, I mean, hopefully your weed pressure isn't that bad, but early on you're gonna have some woody weeds and you're gonna, you're gonna spend a bunch of money on this tarp and it's gonna be really nice when it gets here. And then you're gonna roll it out into the world and it's gonna take damaged mice will eat little holes in it. And that's, you know, you get this expensive tarp and you're like, oh man, you know, I got this hole in this tarp. <laughs> so get used to that. Um, we, we have about eight tarps that we bought and they'll last, their useful life is, is still going on, like from when I bought them. And I'm four years into no-till. Awesome. So. Good. Um, a couple of questions about the bed flip. Um, and a bed flip is not actually turning the soil at all, correct? Yeah. It's just putting point. the new crop in. Good point. Metaphorical flip, right? <laughs> yeah. And then uh, when bed flip, when flipping the bed, can you can run the jang seeder directly without losing the soil? Yeah, I mean you're you're going to be surprised at how nice your soil structures become very quickly oh. in this system. Awesome. Um, so yes, you can run a jank through that. The one caveat to that is if you're leaving a lot of really big root balls in there, like kale root balls and stuff, sometimes you kind of got to drive around those a little bit with the jang for the first, you know, for the first flip. Mm -hmm. um, and then if there's rocks, of course, everybody that's used the jang knows you hit a rock, you kind of bounce off of it. But the tilth of the soil, particularly after occultation, because you're holding some moisture in there too with that plastic is really, really amazing. And you're gonna see improvements in your tilth within months, you know, within two or three crop cycles. So yeah, we'll, we'll run a jang through. It does, yeah, I and mean, I think maybe the point of the question was that it does kind of lift the soil a little bit, but we set our jang at like a quarter to a half an inch deep. Um, and then of course, transplanting, we transplant right into those beds and the tilth allows us to do that. I think that's good. I think we can move okay. forward. Okay, so we'll move on quickly here. I think you know, getting close to the end of the time here, but we will press on. Uh, I get a lot of questions about pests and diseases. Um, occultation, of course, reduces the habitat for pests, um, particularly moths and things like that, if you don't have uh, material for them to lay eggs on. 
Um, and more intensive management of these beds, as I mentioned before, your focus will be shifted to one bed or three beds or six beds instead of one acre or two acres. So I think that the culture of no-till will help you manage pests and diseases. But more than that, this is a really wordy slide. They told us not to do this in, in the preview, but anyway, we, I did. Um, healthy plants resist pests and disease. This is a concept that every organic farmer understands. Um, a plant releases up to 25% of its natural sugars to the soils, feeding the microbiology. That's what we want. Abundant microbial life makes nutrients more available. That's what we want. The nutrients flow back up through the roots. The plants get healthier. As the plants increase, the sugars that they exude in the plant saps and on the leaves increase, and insects lack the ability to digest these sugars, making these plants far less attractive to them. Plus, the healthy leaves do form a cuticle that is resistant to pathogens, particularly fungal diseases. I know this all sounds like a textbook because it kind of is, but in real world situation, I have seen this. Um, my flea beetle problem after two or three years of no-till went to almost zero. Um, I used to buy a ton of Agrabond, floating row cover, and I still use a lot of it for frost protection, but I've saved a lot of money on Agrabond the last few years because I'm not using anywhere near as much to hold flea beetles off um, and various other flying pests of that nature. So healthy plants, through building the carbon in your soils, will decrease your pest and disease issues. Also, no-till systems lead to more perennials. This is an important point I wanted to make. Of course, uh, we grow a number of different perennials and they have a lot of different benefits, one of them, which, they, which include attracting beneficial insects to help with non-beneficial insects, also aiding in pollinators. So that's another way. Better spacing when you focus on beds, better spacing leads to better airflow and less fungal diseases. So it's another little side effect of the no-till approach. And also, as an aside, improved spacing in your beds leads to increased harvest efficiencies. We are also very interested in being as efficient as possible. I, I don't really ever entirely achieve that, but the no-till system has helped that greatly. Switching to no-till for me has increased my efficiency and made a more profitable farm for me. Um, you know, unless we have a few real pertinent questions, Haley, I can kind of switch to a wrap right now, and then we'll take questions at the end. Okay. Some points I want to kind of rehash uh, and go over. Very important to keep your soil covered at all times using tarp or ground covers, leaves, wood chips, cover crops, a cash crop, and yes, even weeds. Weeds are a cover. Weeds are better than bare soil. That goes back to what I was talking about, trying to learn to live with some weeds. Um, High tunnels, I, I mentioned I have three that I grow in and the fourth is a propagation house, but uh, high tunnels, mine are managed similarly to what I talked about. Most of what I talked about and the pictures I showed were outside. This is a picture of one of my uh, indoor growing spaces. Um, you might wanna focus on quicker bed flips even than what I talked about inside of a tunnel just because that real estate is so valuable on your farm. Um, this picture is one of my tunnels. It looks like there's, I think, six beds. This is my six bed tunnel here. Um, and just by way of frame of reference, you know, each one of those beds, we hope to yield somewhere around four or $500 worth of crops and maybe more. So, and we do that several times a year. That makes to me the indoor growing space in these high tunnels, the most valuable real estate on the farm. Very important to focus on efficient bed flips inside your tunnels and also uh, good carbon and good soil building inside your tunnels. Uh, trying to let the seeds, uh, weeds go to seed in there. Airflow becomes important in tunnels. I think that's a standard thing that most people know. Um, and they are the most productive beds on my farm. I think anybody that's grown in tunnels knows that they can be very effective. Consider adding perennials. We talked about that briefly. This is a picture of our asparagus patch. Um, perennials uh, can add a lot of value to your offerings. Their roots help stabilize soils. They can attract pollinators. They reduce labor. You only have to plant them once. Uh, and the root zones create good microclimates, uh, good climates for microbes, which is what we're trying to promote. And the thing that I haven't really talked at all about, but is very important in my decision to switch to no-till was committing to addressing climate change. What we are essentially doing here is creating a giant carbon sink 
on our farm. Uh, growing plants in healthy soils sink carbon. They, they, they will trap carbon and hold it in the soil. We're very interested in regenerative agriculture in um, keeping carbon and CO2 in the ground. Um, I have written here, some studies estimate an acre of undisturbed soil actively growing plants can sequester up to 10 tons of CO2 per year. There's even some movement nationally and federally to start talking about paying farmers to sequester carbon. That would be fantastic. Um, I don't know how they're gonna gauge that, but I think that would really help someone like me and someone like you guys to help uh, to pitch in and do our part to address climate change. It's, it's a very, very serious issue for food production in this world. And I personally believe that this type of agriculture can go a long way to helping to address that. I know that change is hard, but I want you to take from this that no-till, switching to a no-till sh can show you results very quickly within a few months. So a, a number of farmers I've talked to at farmers markets, et cetera, have said, I, I'd love to look into that, but you know, what I'm doing, it works pretty good. So, you know, I, I kind of have a hard time shifting. Um, and if I have to wait years for results, I, you know, I'm not really interested. We noticed positive results on our no-till beds within a few months. We, let, we noticed improved soil tilth, healthier soils, less weeds, which was huge, increased productivity. We were taking more direct climate action. We had renewed focus and interest on my part. Frankly, I was getting kind of burned out doing the same thing year after year after year. This is a whole new approach. It's, it's like a rabbit hole you can go down. Um, like I talked about earlier, I'm really getting into um, nutrient extractions now. It's kind of sprung out of this. So, and another point I would make at the end, and it's another selling point for your farm. I mean, we are marketers here. Um, organic is great. And, and it's, you know, I am certified organic because I believe in it and I like OFA and I want to support them. But uh, it's, let's be honest, it's a marketing tool. And so is regenerative agriculture. It's a buzzword. People, people ask me about it all the time at farmer's markets. So it's something that you can add to your, to your marketing as well. But that's, you know, that's almost a, at the end kind of thing. Um, that kind of wraps up my presentation. Uh, I think we're at about an hour mark here, but I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, actually, um, do you, do you have any models and um, people that you learn from? Like people that you would recommend us look into and? Uh, on the no-till stuff? I mean, I study, I'm gonna get back to my little, I'm sorry about this. There, that's me. Uh, on the no-till stuff, I mean, let's see. I mean, I started talking a lot about soils locally with people like Nate Rutsky and Steve Larson. Um, you know, there's a podcast that you can get into, the No-Till Growers podcast. Um, yeah. Jesse, Farmer Jesse, I think the guy calls himself. Um, he, that's been a really great resource for me. I'm not a big podcast guy, but I've listened to that. And uh, that's where I came across farms like Singing Frogs Farm, um, a couple of others. Uh, who's the guy in Maine? Uh, Frith Farm, Daniel Mays. I don't know these people personally, but I've read some of the things they've written. Um, I think that the no-till regenerative vegetable production thing is, it's not what I would call new, but the people, it's developing. So we are all almost plugging in through like podcasts and social media and things of that nature. And like I say, locally, there's a couple of other thinkers along those lines that, that I, names that I've mentioned that I'm not sure some people in this group might know and some might not. Um, I went to school for sustainable agriculture up in Maine. And I studied with some people like Elliot Coleman and Helen Nearing and people of that nature. So I got exposed to sustainable agriculture very early on. Um, it's just interesting that I spent 20 years doing that type of agriculture in a slightly unsustainable way. <laughs> so um, I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, that's, those are some of the people I plug into. Lovely, thank you. Um, Tanae just put in the chat the um, evaluation for this uh, session. So when we're all done, uh, make sure to fill that evaluation out. It'll help us and it'll help Matt and we'll go from yeah. there. Um, have you worked with building any summer apprenticeship opportunities for Hiram College students? Yes, I, I had an apprentice from Hiram College last year. 
Um, and I hadn't really gone down the apprentice road before. So, and it, it worked out really well. So yeah, the answer, yes. I, I typically, I have employees and I typically pay them. Um, I, it's important to me to pay a living wage. Um, farming is a tough business and apprenticeships always seemed to me uh, a little bit unfair, let's say at times. Yeah. So I kind of shied away from them, but I did have a pretty good experience last year with an apprentice from Hiram and I'll probably look into that again. Yeah. Lovely. Do you, oh, how do you manage perennial crops like berries, rhubarb and asparagus? And do you flip perennial areas? Not yet, no. Um, so it, I don't know if you recall, but one of those pictures I threw up there was of the curvy beds that I had built into the side of a hill. Uh, the way we managed that was we had every fourth yeah, every fourth bed was a perennial bed. So we had three beds of, of annuals and a perennial. So three beds of, I don't know, spinach and then rhubarb. Uh, and then three beds of some other perennial or some other annual. And then we had um, uh, uh, horseradish. Um, the asparagus has, is, has its own area on the farm. Um, but no, we haven't flipped beds. The berries, we are starting in with raspberries they have their own area on the farm we are doing a sort of um i have a lot of room to work with <laughs> so i don't need to build them into my annual areas um so some are some are built in the rhubarb and the, and the horseradish and things of that nature herbs are another good one we grow a lot of herbs those are built right in you know it's like every third bed every fourth bed um strawberries kind of a in-between thing we build those kind of we treat those kind of like annuals sure um, and I want to honor everyone's time. It is 534. The session is technically over, but um, I'm happy to keep going with questions for a little and while. Too. That is. Sure, I can go for a while. Mm -hmm. What is the organic matter of your soil? Our soil is heavy clay, which we have been working to improve organic matter, but we're still only at about 2%. That soil is thus hard to direct seed into without some tillage to break it up. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, just trying to increase that organic matter. I think occultation will end up helping you a lot there too. Um, the moisture level, the moisture that you're trapping is going to help break down organic matter more quickly with the occultation. Um, I, I couldn't give you a percentage of organic matter in my soils because it varies from place to place. Um, but it, I can tell you that it's increased significantly. 2% is pretty low. So I would be bringing in every carbon source that I could find, um, starting with leaves. Um, and I would, you know, if you can afford it, I would buy some compost and, and bring that in. Um, but I think if you begin a no-till journey, you will find your carbon, your organic matter increasing significantly. Absolutely. What cover crops do you use and what is the timing? And someone else had asked the question about you know, what is the timing of when you're putting the tarps down? Because if you're doing a two month, you know, tarp, that might be depending on when you're at in the season, it might be in the middle of summer when you're trying to get things done. So a little bit about timing and a little bit about cover crops. Well, the, the cover crops we use are primarily uh, oats and field peas in the cooler weather, um, some barley. Um, when we have longer periods of time, we, I think we saw a picture of um, sun hemp and sometimes a nice one for hot weather um, and buckwheat. We use a lot of buckwheat um, in, the, in the middle of the summer. That, and buckwheat's great because it breaks down so quickly. Timing is a juggle. Um, so, you know, we will terminate a cover crop very early in its growth cycle. I think a lot of people let cover crops grow um, almost too long. Yeah. So as long as we've got root structures established in a, in a young cover crop, and I need to put that into a cash crop, I'll terminate that. Um, but I can't really, I can't really drill down real specifically on like one month, two month. Um, again, I have, we are right now working with about 150 beds and we're expanding from that. So I've got room enough to go cover crop, cash crop, tarp, cover crop, cash crop, tarp, you know, I mean, down line. If you don't have room enough for that, it becomes more of a math equation for you. Uh, I would uh, just add to that that you'll find as you move through crop cycles in no-till that your tarping time will be less. It also has to do with how hot it is outside, but you will not have to tarp that long in between crops. Sure, that's helpful. And I just want to highlight someone that said, thank you, Matt, very useful, going to sell my tiller. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I still have my tiller. I might sell. I'm thinking about selling. I, the day I sold my mulch layer was like, you know, I was <laughs> really excited because I, I just, it was such a waste. That plastic was a nightmare. And, and I just like, and I really felt really bad. I sold it to a guy I knew and I was like, here you go. <laughs> Great. That's good. That's good. I'm glad. Would you um, would you be able to start no till on fallow land that hasn't been worked for 25 plus years? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Just um, I mean, nobody's stopping you from roughing that ground up with a, a tiller or a plow to start with. Yeah. Um, but you can also I mean, I've seen plenty of successful gardens started by just putting you know, putting that tarp over your area or tarping an area that you want. And you're going to have to if it's field grass, hay, it's going to take the better part of a season to get that ready. So you may have wanted to do that last fall. Um, it brings up an interesting point. I had to ask my certifier about the legality NOP wise of leaving plastic down for long periods of time. We're not supposed to leave like one mil plastic that, that mulch that I don't use anymore down just because it's, it, it, I, I suppose because it breaks down over time or it can. Mm -hmm. um, but it is legal, according to my certifier, to leave heavier silage tarps down over winter and over a season. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that answered the question. I, I want to make sure I do answer it. And the answer is yes. You know, you don't have to have be using already worked ground. You can tarp grasses and kill those perennials out and it'll be nice. I do that now. I mean, I do that now with fields that I haven't broken before. Yeah, I guess my um, picture of that question and others that I've seen in the chat are like, how would you treat them differently? How would you treat a, a fallow land that hasn't been touched differently from something that was just in row crop production? Well, I, I think the occultation period would be longer. Okay. And I think also when you pull in that tarp scenario? off, sorry? In which scenario would it be longer? In the ground that hadn't been used for crops before. Mm -hmm. It's gonna have heavier grasses and weed growth. And I think also you are going to have to be okay with and understand that when you pull that tarp off, it's going to not look perfect. It's not going to look like some of those beds that I showed you that I was, that, you know, it's going to have a lot of, you know, debris on it. At which point you can take a simple yard rake and rake the debris off, or you can go ahead and just start building your beds right on top of that debris, because what is that debris? Carbon. Yeah. So, you know, if you're not going to, you're probably not going to run a jang cedar through that right away, but you will eventually. That's lovely. Um, and, and then there was some questions about your pathways and what you use. I've started using wood chips in some of them. Mm -hmm. um, I think wood, wood chips are nice. They, they, they promote fungal growth, you know, as the wood breaks down. But I don't, a lot of them I don't use anything in. They're just pathways. Um, we, we try to use some clover with very limited success. Um, I think the short answer to that is that's still a work in progress on my farm. And I think wood chips are probably my best answer for that. Lovely. Well, um, if, if there are no further questions or if I didn't uh, give your question proper attention, you can unmute yourself. Um, but I don't see any new. Yeah, and anybody can feel free to, you know, email is a great way to reach me. Sure. Um, and I do read them and I'll answer them. So if anybody wants to reach out that way, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that there's this much interest in this. And I you know I, I'm happy that, you know, I, I really feel like this could be the future of, of really a productive level of growing food in Ohio and everywhere. So uh, I really, uh, I would encourage you to, to try this, if, if even on a small scale, before you jump into it. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>